All right. The red button is on. That means we're live. Hopefully the camera camera stays working uh, and doesn't lock me out again. Hopefully the mic's working. I think we're good. What is happening, Fish and Friends? Welcome to another episode. Super excited tonight. Oh, and I better move this because uh, Randy will get all upset if oh, he's uh, on the bottom again. He doesn't like Shut to be put up. down there. So, of course, we've got the Dizzle. Mr. Dizzle, how are you today? Uh, living it. Dude, like full on two days ago, it was like 70. Super nice here. And then today, yesterday, snow. Today, sleet snow. Yeah, we just got the same thing coming through. It's all right. I'm, I'm not gonna. Help. I'm not gonna cry for either one of you guys. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and so the third third person we have, I'm super excited. Uncle Frank uh, is how I'm gonna refer to him as, Mr. Frank Scalish. <laughs> My good sir, how are you today? I am well. How are you guys doing? We are too. Besides that snow. Um, you know, it could be worse. Spring's coming. And I think, don't we spring ahead tonight, or is that tomorrow? I think that's tomorrow. Oh, okay. Well, I, I, I personally can't wait till they stop that whole thing. I know. I think it's a bunch of crap. I want the long days to stay. Me but too. Me too. What do you do? What do you do? So tonight, okay, tonight we are going to pick Frank's brain. So for, I was introduced to Frank a while back. Um, you can see his, his lure net poster back there. Um, he does some stuff with LureNet, which we will get into as well. Of course, LureNet's been nice enough to send me a couple of their uh, Bank and Creek bags, which I will be giving away. So if you haven't watched that latest video, go check it out. They've got some cool stuff in there, including the uh, the new Elgramite, which Frank was actually just telling me about. Uh, he put a whooping on some fish. So I knew him from that. And I actually knew him from, I didn't know that he did a podcast. So he's going to go through all this with you too. But I actually know, knew him, his name from the professional tournament fishing scene. So all we're right. going to kind of get into all that. So Frank, give us give us the condensed, I'm going to say a minute because you probably won't be able to do 30 seconds. The minute condensed elevator speech of uh, what is Frank all about? Where are you from? What do you do? Okay, well, I, I'm from Ohio, northern Ohio. I live eight minutes from Lake Erie. Um, I started fishing Bassmasters in 2001 when I qualified for the Elites. But it wasn't the elites back then. It was the top 150. Mm, um, yep. Qualified for those. Won uh, Rookie of the Year. Made a classic. Uh, fished full-time for 11 or 12 years. Um, 2011, resigned from the tournament trail. And now I design lures and colors for roughly 25 brands, 25 different lure brands. That is um, awesome. Yeah, it's pretty cool. I do uh, YouTube videos. They're how to fish videos. It's not fish porn. You're not going to watch me go out there and catch, you know, 35 pounders and scream and holler. You're going to know. It's, We're going to have to it, kick you, you off know. the channel then because that's all I do here is catch really big fish all the time. All right. Well, I'll Iowa. see you guys. It was nice to see you. <laughs> <laughs> no, as we discussed before, I'm from Iowa. So that that does not happen on the regular here for me. It's a joke with all my uh, my subscribers. They call them Debo Dinks. So as you can imagine, <laughs> I might catch a lot of uh, pound and a half bass. Oh, so that's it's great. All right. <laughs> Debo's Dinks. Yeah. yeah I'm, I might have to use that. <laughs> Hey, all right. <laughs> On one of my videos, I'm like, oh, it's a Devo Dink, man. Yes. <laughs> Shout it out. I love it. So let's go back and touch on, because I've got so much I want to pick your brain. Frank and I were talking. Unfortunately, I only hopped on about 15 minutes early with him. We should have hopped on like an hour um, and shot the proverbial crap for a while, because he talked about a few things that really interested me, some of it going back to tournament fishing. So in the tournament you know, series and that whole different side of fishing you know i talked about you know fishing isn't fun for me i don't want to do it right right and what it was it like the work that went into tournament fishing because i think oftentimes we've talked about this on some lives that um you know tournament fishing is portrayed as this you know glorified oh you just go around and fish all the time but what really went into that yeah that's a great that's a great that's a great topic because um the work that is involved in, well okay first first of all when i started fishing um the top 150 or the elites whatever you want to call them now um i've never i never saw one lake that we fished on mm. um, they, they were all brand new bodies of water to me so um and they had an off-limit period so i i had to go before the off-limit period 
to sometimes just learn how to navigate the lake. Because so you mean, some, was that like a certain time before your tournament started where it was off limits? Yeah. So you couldn't like get on a pattern right before type thing? Oh no, gosh, no. Um, the off limits was too far away from the event to actually establish a pattern for the event. So I would go there, learn how to run the lake, have a preconceived notion when the tournament's going there, um, the bass will be in what seasonal pattern. So first I would break it down by season. Um, and then I would get more tighter as I got there. Um, and so I spent a lot of time traveling. I spent 238 days a year on the road away from home. Um, and how, it was, how many was that? 238, 238. Jeez. So that's something I've talked yeah. about before to people that, yeah. Uh, one, one thing I've heard, that's what I was telling Frank before is you're a full-time rig driver, you know, a full-time yeah. truck driver, uh, and a part-time fisherman when you're tournament fishing. So yeah, that's why it's yeah. something to me that, so what else, you know, besides that, what else driving and what else? Yeah. So, so then you, you have all the, you have your prep work you got to do. And, and so what would happen sometimes I'd be too far away from home to get back, you know, to go home in between events. So I would find another lake to go to that was close to where I was going to be so I could establish some quasi pattern going in. So at least I can narrow down an idea for when I'm on the actual lake that we're fishing. Um, I, I got to spend a lot of time on the water, but I spent a lot of time on the road as well. And um, budgeted, I had a, but you have to budget for everything. And then there's always the unforeseen. Like, uh, when I went, sure. was when I went to California, um, we started out in Texas. We had a two in Texas, two in California, two in South Carolina, and then I got to go home. So I was gone for four straight months. Um, and when I, when I was in Texas, I had two weeks to burn before I had to fish in California. And so I drove through the Mojave Desert because I thought, well, it'll be cool. I'll go through the desert and then I'll get out of my truck and I'll go look for stuff in the desert, you know, see what I could find, see cool things. And um, didn't work out that way because we had a lot of wind when I was driving through and all the dust and sand. I wound up burning up both of my front end wheel bearings on my truck. Oh, my gosh. And um, the irony of it is, is the truck got so bad i could barely drive it but as soon as i got into um mainstream roads there was a car dealership there and i went in there unhooked the boat they threw wheel bearings on i spent a day there and then went on my way yeah that stuff would i would have so much anxiety trying to do that like okay i gotta get here by this time because like i'm one of those people where if you need to fly like I, my flight leaves at eight in the morning i'm to the airport by like three I'm just like, <laughs> I, I'm, I get so anxious with all that. So like being able to make those back to backs and stuff short on short notice, no thanks. But yeah, yeah you know, the, it's rough. Yeah, go ahead. No, you go. I'm good. Go oh, ahead. that's no, that's what I was going to say. So as far as the tournament fishing scene, so you did that for how long? Like 10, 11 years, right? Yeah. I th 11, 11 years full time. So full-time tournament fishing, what was, out of all the lakes that you visited, what was like your favorite one to fish, if you could go to one? Wow. Um, I love going anywhere I've never been before. Yes. Um, for the challenge of it. Mm -hmm. That's my all-time favorite thing to do. But um, I've fallen in love with lakes all over this country for various reasons. Um, Champlain is one of my favorites because mm. it's a very diverse fishery. Um, without spending a lot of time on it, uh, Champlain's fantastic offshore, near shore, onshore. It's a great grass fishery. It's a great structure fishery. And you've got largemouth and smallmouth. Mm -hmm. um, I fell in love with Table Rock because you have largemouth, smallmouth, and spotted bass. And I love the offshore fishing there. So that really appealed to me. And then Amistad excited me. When we first went mm. to Amistad, it was it was the slugfest days. It was the days when every time you set the hook, it was a holy crap moment. Mm. Um it was it was and I and I'm being polite <laughs> for the <laughs> listeners out there, but but it we was don't get it, demonetized. Appreciate right, that. but but it was it was a holy cow moment. And then um 
I figured Amistad out offshore, and then we never went back. And I was so bummed out because what I figured out offshore was going to a whole nother food chain. And um, I never got to put that into play. Um, you know, Santee was great. I fished Santee when it was full of grass. I fished Santee when it had no grass. Um, mm. I, I love the lake with grass because the grass grows all over the place in the middle of the lake and everything on all the humps and bumps out there. Uh, it made it exciting. It spread everybody out. Um, Santee is not my favorite place. Uh, it, it packs everybody too tight without the grass there and everybody's fighting for real estate. Well, that's the, the interesting thing too, is how much a, a lake can change. You know, you talked about, you know, oh, fishing it this way versus that way it's two completely different lakes like you've gone to you know if oh if yeah you've got a good grass growth or if you've got you know the water's higher versus lower you know it can be a whole whole different game <clears throat> oh so you absolutely you talked about offshore and that's something that that uh, frank and i were talking about that i might have to uh, take a trip me and dizzle get get uh, in frank's area and do some offshore fishing so yeah. frank said offshore is his favorite so like what if you could pick one lure for offshore fishing like what is your favorite if you could lock x in your hand all day what would it be for offshore fishing oh uh, that's pretty simple it'd be the carolina rig but mm. i would never lock myself to one rod offshore sure yep. because i i would have i would have you know big build crankbaits and carolina rigs uh, are my mainstay football jigs probably third Jigging spoons, probably fifth, I would say. Jigging spoons are really good on the vertical. Um, flutter spoons are good on the cast, you know, more horizontal. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, I can find them with a rig and a crankbait. And then if I can't catch them, I'll figure out other ways to catch them. See, that's because that's what Frank and I were talking about before is how, you know, people can kind of grow up in different regions and be comfortable. Right. You know, he's like, if, if he can fish and not see shore uh, all day, he's happy. Right. And mm -hmm. I'm the complete opposite. Like if I get a little bit far from shore where I can't cast to it, I like I start having a panic attack. I'm like, oh, wait, 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 <laughs> um, yeah, so no, I'm I'm really comfortable without seeing anything but my graph. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what we were talking, you know, too, is so much of it is electronics and not necessarily having the fancy electronics. Um, real quick, too, I want to say, uh, Mr. Ty Carbide, become a member. Thank you, my friend. And we've got a ton of people in here. I forgot we didn't even do our normal um, greetings and everything. Of course, thank you to all the members, just like Ty Carbide or uh, our friends here. We got Fishing with Gramps in here, Mr. Randall Pink Floyd, all the uh, the the normal folks are in here. Brown Baco Brennan. Uh, I did see Rich was in here somewhere too, Mr. Hellabass. All the members, all the good folks that always support, I appreciate the heck out of you all. And good, we will good have- Good question. A... Oh, yeah, uh, go ahead. A, there's a time for ABS and a time for Buterit. Um, Buterit by far um, gives you what a is different- bu What is Buterit for us? Uh, okay, all, non... all, no, all Norman crankbaits are made out of Buterit. And- um, other here i'll show you okay this is a buterit bait oh, it's on, got a, it's got a dull a real dull thud sound which really resonates well in the fish's lateral line so here's buterit it's dull dull thud and then here's abs mm, yeah mm. much tinnier tinnier it's, right it's tinnier it's high it's a higher pitch sound um all norman crankbaits are buterit um, hmm. my, one of my all time favorite crankbaits on earth has been Norman. I grew up fishing them. The um, DD 20, what is it? The DD 21, the super popular, the eight, what is it? DD 22 and or deep DD little 22. N are the most, the two most populars. The yep. fat boy, the, the, um, the fat boy, which I have here, the fat boy is one of the best square bills, hmm. I believe. Um, it's real buoyant. It comes through, this thing comes through grass, by the way. The Norman Fat Boy comes through grass. Um, anybody that's seen um, some of the videos I have, oh, I'm fishing this thing through grass. It's you, kind of like you, the Square A a little bit. Yeah, the Square mm -hmm. A is another one, dude. The Square A is a sleeper. Actually, I started fishing the Square A first. And um, it's a cheap lure as far as monetar monetarily goes. 
and de I demolish the fish on the, the bomber square A. And then all these high dollar square bills came out and everybody gravitated towards these high dollar <laughs> square bills. And I stayed on the square A and literally pounded their brains out on that thing. It comes through cover so good. It's unbelievable. And then um, because I'm a Norman freakazoid, um, I started pitching the fat boy around and actually one of the first times I threw the fat boy, this is going to, this is go, this goes against everything. Um, it was winter time and normally in the winter, um, you know, you bust ice, you get out jerk baits, a rigs, typical winter stuff. And, um, this particular lake I was in had green grass still in it. And I said, man, I wonder if they'll hit the hit the square bill. Well, well, the fat boy comes through grass. So I put the fat boy on and I'm and I'm going out of a canal and I just lob it out there and I come through some grass and I get a two and a half pounder. I'm like, no way. I mean, no way. Th that day I caught I had ni a 19 pound limit on the fat boy in the middle of winter. And would you say that gave you confidence in the fat boy? Yeah, I, it, it did because it, it like did. One day like that, you know, one day like that where you just catch the snot out of them on a lure and you're like, okay, I'm confident in this. I might like this lure a lot now, you know? Oh, a hundred percent. And so what happened was what it did was it, 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 it forced me to be more diligent with the bait when it's supposed to work. And then the, then it was just lights out. I mean, lights out. So, um, you know, that's how I really started. Cause normally with the Normans, man, I was, you know, um, middle end, deep, little end, DD 22 and NXS, all the deeper stuff. Mm. And, um, yeah, I'm scared of those. If the bill's bigger <laughs> than like an inch, it scares me. So, oh, you'll be fine, dude. You'll be fine. I promise. <laughs> so what, what is the beauty? I've, I, I didn't know that about the, the different materials, you know, I, I mess with like balsa and stuff, but what is the difference yeah. between the butyrate and the, like an ABS, like poly. Okay. Like well, poly first, first, I, first, we have to qualify this. None of them are bad. They're different. Sure. Okay. Yeah. It's, it almost sounded like a one knocker versus like a, a hard knocker type, like the, right. the tungsten right. knocker in it versus like the, the tinny BB sound. Right. One's deeper, duller. Mm -hmm. The others got a higher frequency. Is so it's just a, a ABS type has of plastic? That. Yeah. It's a harder, like a much harder. Or... Uh, much harder plastic gotcha, so here okay. so here's the thing with butyrate over time the i none of these baits are clear i should have got a clear one none of them are clear you you won't see through that because i painted a gut bag on it you won't see through them but there's a rattle chamber uh -huh. and the and the bearing is the the the, the uh, balls in the rattle chamber it's mm -hmm. just a plastic tube over the course of time when you use a butyrate bait Little residue, powder residue, gets wore off from that constant, you know, vibration of the BB. Right. That is the beauty part because that bait gets better as it gets older. It's like wine, dude. Really? It gets, yeah, it gets better as you use it, better as you use it. Like a sound? Now, <laughs> yes. It gets a little duller, a little hmm. deeper. And um, that's when they get really right so when i was fishing tournaments all the time when i had baits that were starting to sound right i'd put a little black dot underneath the chin with a sharpie boom and that would be the tournament bait and that would be fished only in competition so i would wear out new baits in practice and as they started to get better then they would get a dot interesting um, yeah so i mean and, they, and they're you know there's and back in the old days we didn't have a lot of the technology that we have today so you know and i and so i would put baits on my dashboard and fade them out uh, that's a, yeah you, you know, know you hear guys doing that you know in the sun you yeah. hear guys i was thinking you know how many guys took those baits and put them in like a paint, sh paint shaker mixer thing <laughs> yeah <laughs> right, all mixed exactly. up. i've even seen people like on uh, you know, like a sawzall, you know, where it goes in and out, taping it to the mm -hmm. blade to like try to change the sound of their crankbaits where it's like, you know. Right. Man, because it's the wear and tear. Hardcore. Yeah. 
And, but um, we did all kinds of tricks with these things um, back in the day. I'd, I'd heat the bills and bend them so they wouldn't run as deep and I could fish them shallower. Um, I had a buddy of mine that would, and don't ever do this because you'll ruin your microwave. He'd put it in the microwave for a few seconds and they would oh blow gosh. up. They would go boom and get really big and they wouldn't be able to dive hardly, be a slow wobbling bait. And they would fish it at night a lot. Um now I never I'll be honest with you, I never blew my baits up in the microwave for two years. Yeah, reasons. don't do that. Nobody nobody no. be putting baits in the Dang. microwave with no metal. don't swear to gosh, don't. <laughs> um you did not I never hear that on my channel. Right. I I never did that because A, I didn't want to damage my microwave, and B, I love the baits the way they are. So what I would do when I would want to get a bait and not to run deeper is I would go to 20 or 25 pound line. And I yes, would I would beef yeah. the line up to kill the depth on the bait, yeah. um, and and that worked out really good for me. The other thing too is I wouldn't bomb a cast. Mm. Uh, the Don't longer the cast, right? The longer the cast, you're going to get to depth and stay there longer. So mm -hmm. so I would fish a little tighter, wouldn't bomb the cast out there, and I wouldn't get the bait to full max depth. But the big key was overlining it. I'd overline the crap out of it to keep it sure. running shallower. Yep. Yeah, that's and, a good tip. You know, we hear that now, you know, that especially bank anglers. I've got a lot of <clears throat> bank anglers that follow the channel. Mm -hmm. You know, we'll talk about that exact same thing. You can take a six foot diver and instead of running 10 pound fluorocarbon on it, bump up to 15 or like you said, even 17 pounds yes. and just keep it up more. You know, if you're fishing over some grass or in some wood, you know, where you'd normally get snagged if you're getting it, you know, running eight pound or 10 pound or whatever, getting it as close to that six foot as you can bring it up with the line. You know, that's a, that's a great tip. Yeah. It's, a, um, it's, it's wonderful actually. <laughs> and we're going to be getting into all kinds of question and answer stuff. So everybody that's listening now, you want to make sure you stay till the end. Um, probably I told Frank, we'd probably be on it for about an hour and a half. So probably at the hour mark, of course, we will get the giveaway going. I didn't get to say that either. <laughs> um, so folks like hook shank Hewitt, uh, it looks like gramps re up gramps. I appreciate you brother. Uh, it digs um, out Rob doors. Harrison. I did a, see uh, that. Donation. Okay. I did see that. Thank you, Mr. Randall. Um, I think there was one more in here. I'm jumping over a bunch of uh, comments and questions. I'm sorry, y'all. Big Belly Bassin uh, in the mass. Thank you, my friend. And let's see. So, Mr. Rob. Rob, I owe you a reel. I now know what reel I'm going to get you. Uh, specifically. Metanium. Not a metanium. No. It's something. I'm going to say it's JDM. That's all I'm, I'm giving. Zillion. No. Um, Rob, nights like this are gold. <laughs> exactly, dude. I get so excited for nights like this, um, picking other people's brains, especially when they fish differently for me. So I'm going to try to do that as much as I can tonight with Uncle Frank. Hopefully we can have him on uh, sometime in the future, too, because I know an hour and a half goes way too quick. But yes, time to soak up all the great info. I love these Saturday nights. Thank you, brother. Uh, like I was saying before, one of the best compliments I've ever gotten for the lives is it's like, three guys, you know, sitting around a campfire, having a brew together, talking about fishing is why we like to watch Debo's lives. I'm like, yes, that's the greatest compliment I could get. And that's exactly what it should be. So it's Rob, supposed uh, to be that way. Yes, hey, exactly. Exactly. Mr. Debo, when you yes. have a second, I uh, have been patiently waiting as people have been pointing out uh, in the chat on the sidelines here. Um, writing down questions so i got you know a hand a handful of questions to ask here uh, should, a couple from the chat a couple from the chat a couple from myself okay um go ahead so fire I'm, one off dizzle you've been quiet over okay. there you're scaring me i don't know if you're scheming you're trying to uh hack my computer and... hey you shouldn't be scared you're not the one he's gonna ask the question to oh <laughs> right. you, you got it <clears throat> so uncle frank uh the first question this is for me personally um i know that if you ask debo he's also going to tell you he's got a couple but is there a dreaded lure that you were like, oh my God, why the hell are they biting on X, Y, or Z lure? I hate using that. I'm no good at it. I don't know why they're biting that lure. Why do they have to bite that one? Why not? A jig. They always bite jigs. Is there anything that you don't ever, not don't ever want to, or you don't have that much confidence in when it comes to, to throwing to actually catch fish? <laughs> at, the, at this stage of the game, no. Um... Honestly, no. Um, there's I have preferred ways I'd rather catch them. Sure. Um, 
you know, but there's no lure that I'm like, oh my gosh, I wish they weren't eating that um, anymore. There used to be, it used to be okay. rattle baits. I hate, I hated throwing rattle baits. Like a lipless, like a rattle yeah, trap? like like lipless baits. Really? Yeah, I okay. used to. Now you got to remember something, guys. This is going way back. This isn't like you know the last ten or twelve or twenty years. This is going way back. I, I hated throwing lipless baits because back then I didn't know enough about them. So in my mind, it was you throw it out, you reel it in, you throw it out, you reel it in. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I hated when another guy was fishing a rattle bait in my boat because mm. then if I felt like if I'm throwing one and he's throwing one, it's so much commotion, blah, blah, blah. You know what I mean? But yep. We know today it's not really like that, but, um, you know, over the course of time, I'll tell you a trick. Okay. Here, here's what tricks. I, here's what Spill I did. Beans. Yeah. Here's what I did. Anytime, anytime I would have trouble with a lure or a technique, I would go fish that constantly. As long as it was applicable in the seasonal pattern range, um, I would go fish it constantly um, until I became so efficient with it. It was not a weak spot anymore. It became a strength. Take um, just that. That's what we, we, we talk about. You know, I'm, I'm not good with big swim baits uh, right. or drop shots. I would rather tear my toenails off than fish a drop shot. Uh, but like we've talked about, you just got to take just those out and do it. Right. As long as it's seasonal, as long as it's applicable to what sure. you're doing, because yep. like I wouldn't take a DD 22 out and go offshore during the heart of the spawn. Right. Yep. Okay. Yep. You're, you're setting yourself up for failure, but, but, um, so as long as it's applicable, we had, there, there was a lake that I fished. It had a big size limit on it and it was always one with one or two fish. And I remember as a young guy telling my dad, you know, there's, there's a way to win every single tournament here because all you got to do, if you catch a limit, you're never going to lose because it was, a, it was a, a big size limit lake. So I said, I'm coming out here and all I'm going to do is structure fish it. And so I literally waited till the spawn was over and I went to this lake every free minute I had and all I had with me were two crankbait rods, two Carolina rig rods and a football jig. And I, I, I won every single tournament I've ever fished on that lake since I think 1990, I don't know, four or five or six. Wow. Um, I have, I have not, I have never not won when I so fished a tournament on that lake. Here's a question for you being a big Carolina rig guy. I feel like that's again, kind of one of those cyclical, um, lures, you know, back in the day, dad and I used to throw it a lot, you know, mm -hmm. on, not necessarily ledges, but we had a lot of like river channels and stuff where we'd fish them, you know, dragging it through that. Um, and I probably haven't tossed a Carolina rig the last five years, I don't think. So what yeah. is, because I've, I feel like we hear a little bit more the past couple of years, I've heard it brought around more. And I'm sure it's a tournament thing, you know, guys, you know, on the tournament scene, use it, you know, for specific things. But what is, let's say one tip that you could give somebody that's not that great with a Carolina rig or maybe a couple tips that have helped you be more successful with it. Okay. Um, if I had to keep it simple, um, the Carolina rig is not, it's, it's, you don't have to fish it slow. It's not just a ball and chain. And, right. It's not just a ball and chain. And whoever tells you all you do is catch little fish on it. I will bet them their year's salary that they're 100% wrong. Some of my best, biggest fish have come on the Carolina rig. And my son also, his best fish have come on the Carolina rig. Um, here's the deal. I use 50 pound braid as a main line because that you feel everything. Mm. Um, I, I 99.999% of the time I use a three quarter ounce uh, barrel weight. I use tungsten. You don't have to use tungsten. I didn't use tungsten in the old days because we didn't have it. I used lead and brass. Um, 
I always use a plastic bead because the glass ones will break. And mm. um, on Eufaula, I lost two monsters because my glass bead broke. Uh, so what's your the, the easiest way to understand? Did it cut it? Was that why? Yeah. Yeah, shattered, cut the bead in half, and then the shard Sliced cut the it. line. Um, literally, when I was trying to grab the fish, because we weren't allowed to mm. use nets then. And um, it, it, I still made the classic, but it was almost not a making the classic deal. Mm. But um, but at any rate, so the thing you want to look for with the Carolina rig, because you could fish the Carolina rig from pre-spawn all the way to th through fall. You're just doing it in different places. Mm -hmm. What what I always look for with the Carolina rig is hard bottom. Sure. Yep. Hard bottom. When you're dragging it, if you're dragging over shells, you'll feel the shells because of the braid, to, you know, braid to rod. You'll feel the shells. Um, the best thing I can tell you is that if your Carolina rig getting hung up a lot, you're in the right place. Uh, they want that snaggy stuff, and you're in the right place to get bit. Um, don't I don't hesitate to throw it ever. Um, in fact, I always have two rigged, always. Now, do you vary your? So you talked about your main line going to you know your swivel. Do you vary the length of? Uh, um, My leader. Yeah. Yep. Your leader. Okay. So the the leader, I'm only using monofilament, no fluorocarbon. Why is I, that? I, because I want the I want the leader to float. I don't want oh, it to be sinking sure. on the bottom. Mm -hmm. okay. Um I generally am 20 to 26 inches in leader length. Um I don't like those really long leaders. I know guys that fish a three foot leader or a four foot leader. Um to me that's ludicrous. Uh you snag up way more with the longer leader. Wrapping um, around stuff. Yeah, it just it, the, the bait's the bait's not following the ball. Let's mm -hmm. say okay. um, it's it's going all over the place and it hangs up on everything. Um, your hook setting ability gets hampered if you hook if you set the hook wrong on a Carolina rig. The longer the leader, the less chance you have to get the fish. Um, the, a really good thing is to set the hook properly with a Carolina rig, especially if you're using braid as your main line. I keep it moving nice and slow, keep it moving. The fish bites it. I keep it going until the fish tightens up on me. And then I reel and just sweep the rod and I get them. If you drop down and set it like you're flipping, you'll never land a fish because all you're doing is taking the weight and bouncing the weight off the bottom. You're not pulling into the fish. Um, and so the best thing you can do is just let your rod get heavy and then sweep it across your body and keep reeling and you and you won't lose them my 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 land ratio is probably 99 percent. wow yeah it's, yeah that's it's a great lu tip it's ludicrous yeah that's yeah that's something that people i don't think think about too you know with those different rigs what the weight's actually doing right because they're back here with the bait and the hook all oh, that's clear up here doing its thing so yeah that's a really good yeah. tip for folks it's Here's really cool Here's a good one. Um, both of us, I think, can kind of answer because I've got my take and I'm interested to see what you say. Um, Randy, I think probably and I do the same thing um, because we've talked about rattling versus silence. So I'm guessing Randy would be the same. But if you have a lip, uh, lipless crankbait that won't rattle, should I toss it, throw it away or throw it either way you look at it? Um, I have that issue with the Strike King Red Eye Shad, specifically uh, the Fire Tiger. My take is no, don't, because you can always use a silent lipless or a silent crankbait right. if it's broke, if they forgot to put a ball in it, if it's stuck. Sometimes um, I think that plastic will swell or, you know, it might just be where they um, ultrasonic welded it, you know, whatever. It might not align that up, so it might not allow that ball to move through the two halves, so it might be like stuck in one. I say don't because I think silent crankbaits are underrated. Especially okay. if you're going around a lake and there's, you know, a bunch of guys throwing, you know, real hard, normal rattling lipless. That's my thought. What's your see, I, see, I will agree with that on the, uh, the lipless that's not rattling. But you have to make sure that it still has the weight in it and it still runs properly. Yes. Because if they forgot to put the weight in it then it's not going to, mm, it's not going to do yeah. what it's supposed to do. 
Um, not going to be a half ounce anymore. Right, exactly. It's, yeah. it's just not going to be what it's supposed to be. But this is a case in point. If another guy is in the boat with you and he's throwing a rattle bait, having one that's not making noise might be the might be the trigger because the, if every if it's that time of year and everybody's chucking rattle baits around you know fish fish can tune in on frequency and know it's not edible and here's a perfect example go to the farm pond walk around with a with a rattle bait and fish the rattle bait the first day you go there with a rattle bait you'll probably catch the snot out of them Wait about three or four days, give it the chance to recoup, go back with the rattle bait. You won't hardly catch as many. Give it another week, go back, and you probably catch one or two because they're keying in on the frequency, the sound and the frequency. And they can remember that because they, then they'll know it's not something they should be going after. Um, Inter yeah, that's an interesting one because I've heard um, real quick my brother from another mother in here, Mr. Martin Cram. How are you, my friend? I hope you are well. He used to make all my stickers for me, but uh, after I got my big sticker deal, uh, for, oh, gosh, I forget whoever that was, Bassmouth Big Malone uh, set me up with them, told me where to go. And I, I think it was like, I don't remember, 50 bucks or something for 150 or whatever. So, uh, But I appreciate you, Mr. Martin Cram. I hope you're well. Um, but that's interesting that you say that, Frank, because I've heard from a number of different people that one, sound doesn't matter. I've heard stories from people that two, sound is the ultimate difference maker. You know, like I think that's the argument with like the old warts, right? It had it was made of a different plastic. The way it was put together, they sounded different. It made all the difference. And you've got people saying the new warts are just as good. Those people are just, you know, it's all in their head. So it's interesting that you bring that up. So are you, are you saying that fish can get conditioned? on all these lakes all these tournament places if they're all seeing a, a bill lewis lipless well let me let me just explain this okay they can but some of these lakes are so massive and there's such a huge fish population you're always going to have an ebb and flow of new fish okay sure. you have you have you have bass that are resident creek bass they always live up the creeks they never leave the creeks they spend their life in the creeks then you have fish that run the pelagics and they and and they ch spend their whole life chasing these open water bait fish all over the place well when the pelagics make their migration in the creeks then you have an overlap of bass that never go to the bank with bass that live in the creek Okay, so what happens is your creek bass can get conditioned. The new fish coming in are not conditioned. You follow me? And so, so that's what happens. So, so in those bigger impoundments, it never, you never really see it. Um, you'll, you'll know that you'll be like fishing in a creek and you'll be like, God, the fishing is just not good as it was, you know, last month or whatever. That's because those resident fish are getting conditioned. Now there's baits that bass can never get conditioned to ever, never. Such um, as? Okay. Soft swim baits. They can't get conditioned to those because if they stop eating those, they stop eating real shad and they die. Anything that slithers, crawls and bounces and hops on the bottom. They can't get conditioned to that because half of what they're eating is on the bottom doing that stuff. So you have to realize that that th those baits, those types of baits, the bass won't be conditioned to to not eat those because everything that they do that is edible for the most part. Hmm, that's an interesting and, and, take. Yeah, it's really crazy. But um, the best way to experience it is a farm pond. If you have access to a farm pond, you can go and you could take a lure. You could take a buzz bait out on a farm pond. And literally the first time you go there with a buzz bait, you massacre them. Then you wait three days and go back and you'll catch some, but you won't catch as many. And then go back again three days a week later and you'll catch a few, but you won't catch nearly as many. Um, they just get conditioned to stuff. Now the frog, the hollow bodied frog, they won't get conditioned to that. No sound. It's just a silhouette. It's just something up there plopping on the top like anything yeah. they could eat. That's interesting. Right. That's a that's a really interesting way of looking and thinking about that. And that's the cool thing about fishing too is you can I could sit down and talk to ten different people on a podcast or a you know a live like this, 
and 10 different people might have 10 like cool tips that we've never even talked about before, you know, or the, it could be the same subject and all 10 of us could have different, you know, thoughts right. or, or tips. And th that's, we always say on, on the show, two plus two doesn't equal four in bass fishing. Never uh, does. There's, <laughs> yeah. There's no one right way to do it. It's, you could be out, out offshore fishing and I could catch just as many as you up onshore. Now, granted, Absolutely. I'd be catching pound and a half Debo dinks and you'd probably be catching five pounders on the Carolina rig. <laughs> hey, still. Oh, um, no, I've got my brains kicked in when guys were fishing the <laughs> bank and I was out there, believe me. Yep, yep. Believe me. Um, Jim in the house, Mr. Tackle Junkie. I actually was going to say, too, when we were talking about the square A, the bomber square A. Um, I brought that up because we've got a, a fishing friend, uh, Jim. He has a YouTube channel. He is a, a huge fan of the square A. So that's why I brought that one up. He yeah, loves. that's that's that bait's magic, dude. It's magic. Patrick in the house, too. Mr. Patrick, how are you, friend? Patrick, um, what's up, dude? <laughs> man, we've got a ton of good questions. So one more that I starred, and I don't know if if this is anything you've tinkered <clears> with. <throat> um, Japan Tackle, good uh, good guy here. He likes his gear and stuff so he'll throw the the fun gear questions in um oval split rings or round split rings for tournament crankbaits and i know this is kind of going to segue us into some other stuff i want to talk about um like you talked about before you helped design some lure colors and stuff for a number of different brands so what's your preference and maybe give us the a breakdown of some of the stuff that you paint and maybe what you look for in a crankbait, or I don't even know where to go. There's so much we could go. Yeah, it's it's endless. We'll 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 get where we got to go though. Um, okay, oval split rings on my jerk baits, absolutely, one hundred percent. Anything. We're um, talking deep divers, square bills, jerk baits, anything. My jerk baits get oval. Uh, most of my crank baits will get a round split ring, but my jerk baits get oval for sure. One hundred percent. Yeah, I just think it moves it better. And I and you guys are going to freak, but I always tee my I always use a a Norman speed clip on my split ring. Um because that really gives me a lot of freedom of movement. Mm -hmm. I never I never tie my line directly to a split ring ever. Um, that that is one thing that I've struggled with too because you can get where it'll run up in that that uh the gap of it and you'll get your line you're not going up into it. Yeah, so that's the be kiss careful. of death. Yeah. yeah. Plus, I think I get more movement, easier movement. So if I'm, you know, a lot of times you'll take a deep crankbait, and sometimes I'll I'll take a deep crankbait, run it a little shallower than it's supposed to go, and then I'll fish it like a Carolina rig. I'll get it on the bottom and I'll just pull it, doom, 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 mm. doom, 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 and then pause it, pick up the slack, doom, 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 doom. and so. Um, you know, so there's, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of really cool stuff you can do when you fish. So as far as crankbait, the, I told you this question was going to come up. I knew we'd get into, uh, to some gear questions. So we'll save this one on screen. We'll get, maybe give you some time to think about it. I told him we would, we would, uh, pick his brain for some gear stuff, but going back to crankbait stuff, what is, let's, I know you said you brought some stuff to show us. So you also paint cranks, which I am oh, a, yeah. a crankbait painter as well. What are some of your, let's say, two top two favorite patterns that you think catch the most fish, and then your top two favorite patterns to paint? Okay, um, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna English. answer your question, but I'm not gonna answer it the way you asked it. Okay. Um, you sound like Randy Dizzle. Dizzle does that too. I'll ask stuff and then he just does whatever he wants. So no, no, I'm going to answer it. But oh it's gonna no, be... do whatever you want. No, no dude, I'm answering it. I promise. <laughs> um, I always let's go shad patterns. Okay. Okay. I always will have natural shad patterns, and natural is like natural. It's a natural, just a natural shad pattern. And then I'll have a hot shad pattern. Show us that shad. Okay. Again. Sorry, I missed it. Nat, this is a natural shad pattern. Uh huh. Okay. And this is a, this is a Norman DD twenty two, by the by. Um, but I'll have a natural shad pattern, and then I have a hot shad pattern, like a chartreuse in blue, a chartreuse in white. Um, I always like have water. Well, I you catch fish in them in clear water too, mm. but. But I, because bass will have a preference, they'll, they'll be on hot shad patterns or they'll be on natural stuff. And, and so I always carry hots and naturals. I do the same thing with my crayfish patterns. I'll have 
I'll have here. I got just because I have them here. Okay, so I'll have a hot crawfish pattern, and this this is what I painted for Norman. Um, I'll have a hot crawdad pattern like that, or or like this uh, rebel craw that I did in like a fire tigery kind of Sweet, yeah. feel to it. And then I'll have natural ones. So with the natural ones, you know, I'll do, you know, like a rusty craw. That's mm. one that's one I painted too. Um natural or or a common crawdad, just very natural looking. Mm -hmm. Duller colors, more natural right, life like, right. yep. Because that because the bass will they will absolutely show a preference, and so that's kind of how I operate with my crankbaits, natural hot, um, same hmm, pattern okay. natural shad hot shad. Um, I have bluegill colors too. Um, here I'll show I'll show you some. Um, this is a fat free shad. This is a, this is a hmm. real real bluegill pattern. I'm trying to get the pearls on the side to mm -hmm. illuminate but it's hard with the the way the light purple uh, iridescence on it correct yeah. so so there's this is a regular bluegill and then this is a pumpkin seed bluegill mm. and you can see the difference like between it. a regular gill and a pumpkin seed mm -hmm. okay and then i and then i'll have the rock bass and and then just a regular shad pattern where am I going here? I'm lost. There we yep, go. Yep, there you go. There you go. And these are Norman Fat Boys. So this is a, this is a Booyah XCS, by the way. Mm, I, that's one I have not thrown. Uh, that's supposed to be like the um, supposed to be like an old crankbait, right? Uh, yeah, it's it's like the Excalibur XCS. The Excal there you go. Yep. And for, well, it is. It's not like it is, and it's silent. Telling you those silent ones are underrated. I was throwing a silent Lucky Craft one day. Me and Randy were out, and it was just. I think there's something to be said about those. There's there's a time for subtlety. There no question. Heavily fish pressured areas, subtle baits, cold front conditions, subtle baits. I mean, there's a time and a place for noise and no noise, or little bit of noise. You know, um, and and so that's kind of you just kind of keep that in the back of your head because when you experience the success, you have to remember why you had the success with it so you could duplicate it down the road. And that's one thing too that these have helped with. So you know, doing YouTube has been fun because you know Randy and I'll go back and watch old videos and be cracking up about the conversations, but also mm -hmm. saying, "Wow, dude, do you realize that this exact time last year we were doing X Y Z on this lake?" Let's go try it. You know, are the are the conditions the same? Oh no, it was twenty degrees warmer that year. You know, so you can kind of right. look at stuff. And now going back to that, here's one question that I get a ton: Do you still throw shad patterns on lakes that are known to not have any shad? Maybe they do, but let's just say that nope, this lake for all intents and purposes does not have shad. Will you still throw shad patterns? Absolutely, one hundred percent. Um, because it still represents some type of fish. Yes. And and the reality of it is, is if you if you've caught bass in deeper, dirtier water, they're almost white. There there there's no distinct. They still have the markings of a largemouth, but they're pale. There's not a distinct difference. Like you catch them out of clear, grassy lakes, and they're beautiful. The blacks are black. The greens are green. They're beautiful. So fish are. I don't want to say they're chameleon like, but they're first built for survival. And so they're going to, you know, they reflect their environment for the most part. Bluegill will do the same thing. And baby bluegill don't look really like bluegill. Um, baby bluegill yes. are like purple pearl, blue pearl, green pearl with a back color and very faint, if any, bars on them. Um and so when you're throwing a shad pattern, it could represent a smaller bluegill too. That's what so we talk I, about I, here. Yeah, too. So I'm I'm glad I'm glad my thinking was right because I'm I'm obviously no pro, but that's kind of my thought process too. Is you know, here in Iowa we've got crappie, they could be eating, they could be eating white mm -hmm. bass, hybrid bass, yellow bass, they could be a bass from the bottom is all white, right? Belly's all Absolutely. white. Absolutely. If they're looking up at it, it could look like, you know, just a bass. I don't know if I have any pictures of a bluegill, but 
Okay, good. I'm glad glad we were on the same wavelength for that. Otherwise, because that's what I've told people. I'm like, yeah, you don't have to have it. And if you'd have come on here and been like, oh, no, any pro knows that if you throw a shad pattern in a lake that doesn't have shad, you're an idiot. Then I'd have been like, well, it uh, looks like we're up for live tonight, guys. <laughs> no, swear to God. Well, why do you throw chartreuse in blue? Yeah. What the heck? What does that look like? You know, for that matter, what does fire tiger look like? Sure. Yep. You know what I mean? And and fire tiger breaks every rule in the book because I, I've caught I've catched smallmouth on fire tiger in the clearest lakes on earth. And so. that, that was yeah, so that's something that I'm honestly kind of locked into that I need to get out of my comfort zone is clearer water, more natural and translucent cranks, dirtier water, uh more solid, like opaque and brighter stuff. So, you know, like when you said they can be on those two different bites, I don't really break it down that way. So that's interesting that you say that, that they can either be, you know, the natural shad bite or the hot, you know, brighter type bite. Well, here, let me ask you a question. Did you ever go out and you're fishing in a place and there's a bazillion shad? There's mm -hmm. shad everywhere you look, right? Yep. You're like, okay, so I'm going to throw this shad colored crankbait. Why are they going to eat this thing? It looks exactly like everything else, but you go in there and you throw them, you know, something different. That's it's all of a sudden it stands out. It's different from everything else that's over there. It stands out. You're probably getting reaction bite out of it rather than a feeding bite. Cause when they go into those schools of shad, they open their mouths like garbage cans and they're trying to get everything they can in their mouth. So now you're, now you're giving them a target. You're giving them something to pinpoint. Um, why that does a methylate sense. float and worm work? Sure. Yep. Okay. You could see the methylate a mile away. That bass sees the target. There's nothing in nature that looks like a methylate worm. It's just the target. You know, like yeah, here, dude, when point. I, dude, when I paint walleye lures, okay. Cause I paint a lot of walleye lures. So here, what the hell does that look like? <laughs> okay. I mean, seriously, what does that look like? Oh. That looks like nothing on earth. Bright and different. Yeah. And some fish, it seems like are more, and I think about that, you know, like if I'm crappie fishing or, you know, like walleye, I'm not afraid to go with, you know, a bright chartreuse pink head. Bass Absolutely fishing, I don't know. I, I get, you know, I think we get pounded into our heads so much that match the hatch. The better you match the hatch, the more fish you'll catch. You know, if you're not throwing it, it's going to look just like something there. You're not going to be successful. And I, I think I'm guilty of that too. Like I'll, I'll tend to go with more natural stuff, you know, a lot of the times, except for purple, for whatever reason, purple in the Midwest tends to work all the time yeah. for me. Yeah, um, purple is a good purple, pur anything purpley hued or purple is good. I agree with that. Okay, one we skipped over so well. Dizzle, they said if he gets up to go get a drink or something, he's probably going to go try microwave in his jigs like your buddy yeah, doing good, the crankbaits. Good, good luck with that, dude. I'm, I have nothing to do with that. I told you not to do it. <laughs> Same, yeah. Disclaimer, you did not hear that here. Uh, I do not. Gator, condone. what's up, dude? I know Gator. Gator in the house. Uncle Frank. Um, okay, so I've got, I've been starting some questions. Randy, I'm going to let you fire away. You've been quiet over there. And again, I don't know if you're scheming or what you're doing. So, Yeah, no, I'm just kind of, kind of listening, checking out the chat, uh, writing stuff down, but. Yep. I've noticed you um, responding to people. Thank you, my friend. Yeah, no worries. Um, you know, uh, somebody had asked, uh, I'm not, I don't remember. I didn't write it down who it was, but uh, going back, Uncle Frank, to the uh, life on the road, I guess you can call it. How did the restocking process go from event to event? Okay, mm. here we go. Cause I have a system. Holy smokes. That's a, that's a crazy good question. Okay. So here's what I did. All right. My basement looks exactly like a tackle shop. I have pegboard up. I have everything on pegs. I have an inventory. It's full. I have tackle in my truck. That's also inventoried and full. Then I have tackle in my boat. So if I'm using this lure and I lose it, when I get off the lake that day, I go to my truck and I take that out of my truck and I put it in back in my tackle box. Then the minute I get home, 
I replace that lure from the inventory. So at all times, now you can have as many as you can afford or as many as you want, but I carried nine of every color crankbait and every crankbait that I carried in my wow. boat, I carried nine. In my boat, I carried four of everything. And I didn't. Okay. I don't store them with hooks on because I can get more in a more in a, a mm. thirty seven hundred. Um, That's a good tip too. And then I'll, you just marry them together. You know, you put them in and you just marry them up mm -hmm. with no hooks. Then when I get on a bite, if I know that crankbait A is catching them, then I'm going to put hooks on a couple of them. So if I lose one, I don't have to monkey with the hooks. Um, and that's kind of how I inventoried. Now, to be really honest with you, you have to make sure that the bed of your truck is a hard cover and lockable. Mm. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I can because imagine. You're, you're carrying a ton of stuff in there. So you have to yeah. make sure it's hard cover and lockable. Um, I learned a real big lesson on Kerr Reservoir one time I was fishing, um, jerry ryan's tournament trail when i was younger and um i was catching them on a deep little end in lavender shad and normally i, I would have shed. yeah i'd be loaded in the boat with them because it was one of my favorite colors so i would have you know four to six in the boat i'd have at least nine or ten in my truck blah 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 well back then i wasn't as organized and I said, oh, I got, I, don't worry, break it off. I got a ton of them, you know, break it off, tie another one on. I'm in the boat. I got one left. I'm like, holy smokes, man. It's the only color of crankbait I'm catching them on. When we get off the lake, we got to go back and get them out of the truck. I go to my truck. I have zero, zero in my truck. And I wind up breaking that stupid crankbait off the next day oh. on the third cast. That's what I was going to ask. If you ever ran into a situation carrying all those, have you ever got to a point where you've ran out and we're like, that was the deal. So did you recover? Did, were you able to find one that got bit just as well or no? Was that color the deal? That was the deal for me. Um, and I did not catch him after that. I did not catch him after that. Um, and that's when I said I have to have a better system. And so that's when I went to the inventory system. That's a lot of work. Yeah. I mean, that's, this is the type of things that like, there's just so much to think about in tournament stuff. How am I going to make sure not, not only packing all the stuff that you have, but making sure you understand what you have, where it is. I mean, hell, just understanding where you've got your stuff here. You know, I, my, you're right about, you're right about that because let me ask you a question. How much time do you and the audience, the people that are listening, how much time do you spend, do you think you spend in the course of a day of fishing, hunting, searching, and looking for lures to tie on? If you waste 10 minutes, that could be how many, how many bass? If you waste 20 minutes, how many bass? Right. You know what I mean? So everything in my boat is labeled every box has labels on it what's in it and in my storage i have all my crankbaits up front and all my soft plastics and jigs in the back so i know that i don't have to open a tackle compartment lid and go where the heck are the jigs where the heck are the this where are my dingers at i know because it's going to be in the front third the middle the back you know what i mean it's going to be in a chronological place plus i have a label on it so i don't waste i don't waste a, a minute ever in the boat now granted now that i'm not tournament angling anymore and i'm doing more of the video thing now i know what if i'm catching them on let's say i'm catching them on a, a gb hayes dinger i'll take four gb hayes dingers and i'll just throw them on the deck of the boat um because I'm not running and gunning. I'm not, you know what I mean? It's a little bit different when right. you're not c competing. It's a little bit different. Every second, yeah, you can you can you know. afford to be relaxed for, you know, that right. 10 minutes where right. before it's like he who makes the most casts win. It's like if you feel like you're sitting down for a minute, it's that could have been the fish. You know, that could have been the one that put me over the the next guy. I want to look up these, these <clears throat> Norman speed clips. Have you ever had one bend out or ever had an issue with an, a Norman speed clip? Because I know a number of people that, 
tell me they're really good. And I'm not a big clip guy. Like I'm always tying to my, my split rings. So if you have recommendations, I know you talked about the Norman speed, speed clip and there's other people. The Norman speed clip to me is the best because if you could find it and pull it up and put it up there, that's what I'm doing. Um, it's like, it's like a double O ring because the end of the Norman speed clip is, is a split ring basically. And I've so never used these. they're fantastic, dude. Yep. There it is. Uh, they're Michael, absolutely fantastic. I a question. I drop that off real quick. So you, you squeeze it, you squeeze it, uh -huh. and it and it opens up the split ring portion of it. And then you just put your split ring in there, wrap it, you put your split ring in, wrap it around the other side, and then it locks in place. And you got, it's like having two split ring connections. Hmm. You have to get some of those and try it. Yeah, I get, so you squeeze it and then just run your lure around it down to the bottom and then it just right. sits in there. Huh. Right. Okay. But don't take your split ring off the lure put that to the split ring you'll have much more freedom of movement and here look where you tie your line there's nothing to abrade your line yeah yeah when you tie to a split ring if your line goes in with the split yeah we're you're talking asking like right for problems here. like if you were tied right here in your line like, yeah can you guys see my cursor you can oh see heck it, right? yeah okay yeah. yeah yeah so like when you tie to a crank but somebody else asked the question well if you have that trouble on a, a split ring where do you tie it to so I always make sure that this part, like where it's split, you've got that little gap where you would slide the hook in. I always make sure that's pointing back toward the bait and I would tie it here. Now it's a risk. I understand that. But, you know, I don't change out all mine to ovals. And that's why I kind of do like the Strike King puts the ovals on them because you don't run into that trouble. You know, it's or I, I don't as much, I guess. Right. Because it's on the side. The split's on right. the side. Yeah. Um, but you know, but you but you see what I'm saying. I mean, it's fast. It's easy. Yeah, I'll have to try some of those. I'll get us some dizzle. Yeah. We'll try them out. So, what are what are the sizes, or what sizes are you are you saying? I are think the, it's the I th okay. I think it's only. Um, well, I did see they had a Magnum one too. So must be yeah, not. Like... It's definitely not the Magnum one. <laughs> it's they only have two sizes, and it's not okay. the Magnum. Yeah, we'll get some of those and try them. Oh, look at that. My Norman speed end was up there. <laughs> yep. So, the, okay, so that's another, this is a perfect segue into this. So you help companies uh, design yeah. and do like the lure patterns. Uh, well, I actually that... designed that bait too. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Tell us, tell us more. This is cool. Okay. So the speed end's a cool bait. It's got a real super tight, super tight wobble, almost no pitch and roll. It's fantastic early spring, um, you know, when you're throwing it on the rocks and stuff. It's fantastic early spring. It's good over grass. Um, it, and and here, I, I actually did a video on this bait in, this, in the post-spawn, actually early summer. The bass were just going offshore, but they weren't, like, oh, deep shed. yet. Yeah, there's lavender shad. That color's just banging, man. That's just a bang of color. Now people know why. That and here, perfect. and that, and that lavender shad dude is the one of the first colors Norman came out with. That and chartreuse and blue. That color is so old, it's ridiculous. And then that's people call that citrus or tropical shad. Citrus Norman shad, calls yep. it tropical shad. So what? So what did that process look like for you know for like testing a new bit? Because I've actually they've got the the junior now, right? Yeah, Don't that's a small. Yeah, the junior's a good running bait too, man. Alive. Oh, okay. yeah. So yeah, okay, so, for... so here I'll tell I'll tell you the process. So I I wanted a bait in Norman um, that behaved very similar to a speed trap, but that cast a mile. Um, it, you could cast these things in the wind like bullets because they're all gel coated, so they're heavy. They're gel coated, and they're three at uh, three eighths ounce. And I needed a bait that, that did all that, but if it's windy out, I can still pit throw the thing. So I started, and I wanted the deep little end body style. Um, and so basically what I did was I shaved the bill off of one, uh, off of a, a different Norman, shaved the bill off of it, um, and started experimenting with bill shape, bill design, and bill angle. Um, it took me a while because I was cutting everything by hand. Um, you know, cutting it all by hand, doing all that stuff. So um, if I wasn't 100% accurate, 
the bait wouldn't run. Mm, once yeah. I got a, once I got three working prototypes, I sent them in to be catted, you know, blueprinted and 3D Matched model out, mapped made. Out. Yep. Th then they sent them back to me, not painted, not nothing. Just send them back to me to run them. So then I then I ran them. I picked the best one out of the ones they sent me mm. that ran that ran the way I wanted it. Um, and then then we went from there. Once we got the one that ran right, did what it was supposed to do, then we went to the color. You know, then we went and added color. This is one I've not fished the mat in. Must be an old uh, mat, yeah. So what? So, so you, you talked about, you know, taking the little in and, and altering that. So where would you throw something like this? So, you know, it's not, it doesn't have to just be your normal square bill stuff. I'm assuming with this kind of being a modified, how and where would you fish this? Right. So, so what, like traditionally I would take all my crawdad patterns early in the spring, the water temperature is still cold, 42, 45 degrees. You're fishing 45 degrees, sloping rocky banks near spawning areas. Um, and you're fishing it that way. If let's say if the grass is, if you, if the lake has grass in it, the grass is growing up, but it's nowhere near the top because it's still freezing cold water. Grass hasn't grown, grown yet. Um, I'll run it over the top of those grass. Blaylock almost Blaylock. Uh, I forget if he took third in the classic or fourth in the classic at Gunnersville throwing the speed in. Because it's kind of like I was looking at, for some reason, I can't get one to show us like a side view, but it's almost like a hybrid between a, like a six foot, you know, that longer, you know, that we think of like a six foot diver mixed with kind of like a flat side, almost like a rounded flat side for that tight wobble, you know, colder water. Yeah, the bait, the baits actually, um, well, here, I'll show, I'll show you the bill style here. Um. Just bear with me because this is just going to be fast, dude. And it's going to be much larger than real life. <laughs> How's that? I love it. <laughs> Little love disclaimer. Props. So, so that's that's really how it's designed. It's kind of almost like a square bill, but not quite like a square bill. Yeah, not that shorter, stockier, you know, banging off right. uh, erratic type of. Because I, I need, because the, the purpose of the bait is it had to have almost no pitch and roll and had to be a very tight vibrating bait. So, so you could burn that thing in or slow crank it and it just tracks. You know what I mean? And that, that's how it had to go. Because a lot of times I'll burn it over deep grass. When I say deep grass, if the bait runs down six feet, the grass can't be growing up to three feet. You know what I mean? Sure. It's got to be, you got to be just touching it every now and then, just touching the grass. Um, and, and it's it's dynamite, dude. It's dynamite. That bait's something else. Randall, what else do you got for questions? I'm going to get our giveaway started here. We're an hour and eight minutes in. Holy um, so again, I know, dude, it goes so fast. Again, Time uh, hats flies. off to Uncle Frank for jumping on with us. Uh, this has been a wealth of fun. I love digging into this stuff. So I'm going to get the giveaway going here. Like I said, we'll probably go for about an hour and a half. We uh, we might have to do another session with, with Frank sometime in the future because I think we could probably <laughs> pick the poor guy's brain for about five hours tonight. And still have we are because I brought – look at I have I have I know. props. We love I props. Have, I have props. I have things, man. So <laughs> – I even have like tricks and tips for painting. I have things going on, but we don't. I mean. if, if we don't get to them, we could do another one. Don't worry about it. <laughs> Two thumbs up, Randall. What you got for questions? I'm going to get us a. Uh, um. So this one. is, this is one that's. I don't know if it's going to be a controversial question or not. Oh, but, I don't care. <laughs> so. I know everybody, you know, everybody, you know, growing up, if they were into fishing like Debo and I were, you know, watching Hank Park or Bill Dance, whoever it was on TV, you're all like, when I grow up, I want to be a fisherman and things like that. And I want to be on the tour. And, you know, I've read a couple of guys' books and I've watched some YouTube videos. And ultimately they say, you know, it, it, it's somewhat not all that it's cracked up to be. 
and in turn, so I know I fished, I've personally fished some like little local tournaments in the past and I've fished so many like in a season where it's like, this isn't even fun anymore. Have you ever run into the instance where, I guess when you were on the tournament or when you were on the series, like fishing didn't, it wasn't fun anymore for you to get out there and grind it every day. Burnout. And it, yeah, yeah, kind of like a burnout. And if so, what, what did you do to try to overcome that? Or what was the fix I got to kind of get away? I got a great, yeah, I got a great burnout story. Okay. Um, there came a point in time, probably my fourth year in, maybe my fifth year in where I just was done. I mean, I was like, this is BS. I'm sick of driving. I'm sick of not being home. My wife's raising the kids without me. Mm -hmm. um, you know, what am I doing? Um, is this worth it? You know, all, all that, all that crap goes through your head. And, um, I literally had to like get out of it. So I did what any red blooded fishing human being would do. We had a break in between events and the first break we had, I think was a month. I put my boat up. I never, I didn't even go in it. D didn't even go in it. And then I'm like, what am I doing, man? I want to go fishing so bad. <laughs> so I went to a place where I know I could just wreck them. And I just went out and wrecked them. Like, just wrecked them. And then started having fun at it. And then I decided that um, I'm going to fish for other species other than bass. Okay. And I started chasing muskies and pike and steelhead and crappies and everything but a bass and um started loving life again because i was in, i was into it but what i didn't realize was happening it was making me a better bass fisherman yeah because i started understanding things that other fish were doing and i was going wow you know blah 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 like i i saw i like i i actually guided for steelhead in the winter months really and I would see, yeah, I fly fish for them. And, and then I fly fish saltwater too, but that's a different story. But anyway, I would see these steelheads sitting in the water so fast that, that I could hardly walk across it. Like literally I could hardly walk across it. And that steelhead would just be sitting there and barely moving a fin to stay in place. Mm -hmm. Then I realized now I know why the smallmouths are always in the tail races because the current doesn't affect them like it affects you and me. There can be a baseball sized boulder on the bottom and it's kicking up enough of a current mm -hmm. block for that smallmouth just to sit there. And anything that comes whisking by, he runs out and grabs it and goes back behind his little baseball. That opened the door for me for fast current fishing for, for bass. Um, and so I started learning things that I didn't understand. I, I kind of knew that you fish the tail races and you do all this, but I didn't understand it. But then I understood it. And so it, 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 just, it, it just cleared my head. It just did everything right for me. And, then I, and I've never been sick of fishing ever since that. Yeah, yeah sometimes I know. you have Go ahead. Uh, I, yeah, I was just going to say, I know, um, what was it, um, when the pandemic was all shaken down, so that uh, spring and the summer, uh, working from home, like, I was like, oh, shoot, I'm working from home. I'm going to, you know, before I don't have to worry about getting a shower taken and all that looking nice to go, go to work. I'm just going to go fish before work real quick. And then I'm going to go fish on lunch real quick. And you know, what the hell I'll go fish after work. And for me, I kind of, you know, it's not uh, my lifestyle or it's not my, I guess my way to earn money, but I was doing it way too much. I even told Debo, I was like, man, I've been, I've been out, I've been out fishing this week 24 times. I don't, <laughs> I don't want to go fishing. You know, and right. for me, it was to the point of, 
I wasn't putting in that quality fishing time and it was more of a stress and a pressure and, you know, kind of like you said, trying to find something to get you back into having fun, whether it be a different species, a different type of fishing, whatever it may be, was the way to, to kind of go about it. And it's, it's kind of good to hear that my train of thought is, you know, someone in your shoes, you know, you kind of did the same thing, but yeah, I totally, I totally get that. And it, like you said, it does help you quite a bit to kind of see what other things are attracting those other type of species absolutely i mean you know um a, a, a traveling tournament pro experiences some type of burnout whether mm -hmm. it's drastic or not if your head's not in the game you're not catching them and if you're not catching them that's worse and so you always got to stay on top of things you know what i mean it's yeah. like it's like when I struggle in a tournament, if I have a tough tournament, I stay after the tournament and keep fishing the lake till I figure out where my mistake was. Mm. And that, and that was, that was part of the burnout stage because I was, I, the tournament was over and I was, I'm not going anywhere until I figure out where I went wrong. And so it was like double, triple the work because I always tell everybody I, I wasn't as smart or as good as a lot of the other guys. I had to work 10 times harder at it. Um, and so I did. And, and it's paid off dividends now, obviously, because experience, there's no better teacher than experience. Right. There's no better teacher than experience. Um, and so, so you just got to put the work in. And every time as a, as, a, as a fisherman, as a fisherman learns and gains knowledge, his, his rise of knowledge, he'll look like a stair step. He'll have an increase in knowledge because in the beginning, you don't know hardly anything. So you learn stuff, you're, you go up. Then you plateau a little then bit. You plateau, yeah. And then all of a sudden the bell goes off and you learn some other stuff and you go up and then you plateau again. So you're as a fisherman, your learning curve is like a stair step. Well, if your stair step goes like this, like this, and then all of a sudden you got this really long step, that's where the problems come into play. Yeah. You and then it only it only compounds, especially if that's you know your way of making money. You're you know, your stair step isn't stepping and you're stuck on that plateau and you're just, you know, beating yourself up over and over right. and over again and burning yourself out even more. Uh, real quick, before we move on with this Debo disclaimer for the drawing, um, all of you are probably aware um, the drawing tonight for the giveaway or any giveaway with Debo and his channel, uh, you must be present to win um, any of the Canadian um comrades brother in however you want to say it unfortunately it's expensive to ship so debo is going to work something out with you regardless of where you're located if you do happen to win uh not me of course because debo will just redraw if my name pops up but you'll want to send debo an email with yes. the picture of your icon or you're not your icon but whatever you want to call it your, your name your youtube proving. Yeah, we, yep. we've had uh, we've had thievery trying to happen, people trying to win stuff that wasn't them. So um, I'm going to draw here in just a second. Yeah, if you're from Canada, I'm not going to ship you stuff. It just it's too much of a hassle. I'll send you a gift card. I'll pick you up a gift card somewhere. Um, but tonight we'll do a giveaway of I don't know. I'll throw in one of my custom baits since we're talking about some custom stuff um, and a box lures. Like I said, it's normally like 50 bucks worth of stuff. I'll I'll throw in for you all. So that we will draw here. If you have not entered hashtag Frank, if you want to be <clears> entered. Um, and while we're waiting, I'm going to give you all a minute. Um, our good buddy Kuda over at Jig Squad, he also has a, a YouTube channel podcast. Uh, if you all haven't followed Kuda, he is uh, a real deal. Uh, his last one was interesting where he talked about, you know, real people and, and that type of stuff. I enjoyed it. Um, but for Frank, was that so the the Norman uh, thin end? Junior, yeah. Was it a replacement for the thin end? It was not a replacement for the thin end. The thin end was a flat side. Uh, this ah, is not okay. a flat sided bay. Um, the, you know, uh, the bomb, the bomb, deep bomber flat A is actually, is actually the bait. That's a, that's a great flat sided bait, but the, the, there's no replacement for the Norman thin end. 
Okay. And the Jig Squad. That's a that's a that's a great that's a great uh, podcast and a good um, Instagram channel too. Yeah, you Kuda. see a lot. You see a lot of good talented guys doing stuff on that. He shares a ton of stuff. Yeah, that's that's something he does great is, uh, you know, sharing the wealth of people that make their own tackle and, you know, the smaller tackle shops. Um, Kuda is a good cat. So, yeah, go give him a follow. And somebody did ask, I think I started as one uh, just real quick. Yeah, what is your YouTube, Caden asked? Okay, so you could go to LureNet YouTube and um, there'll be bait called Bait School videos, but you got to go to LureNet YouTube. Um, and then you, and, okay. yeah, and you'll see them all. And then my Instagram is scalish underscore fishing. Scalish under, yeah, I think I just uh searched Frank, Frank Scalish, and it came up too. Well, my son's also a Frank Scalish, so you I gotta, think he's junior, though. I think his says yeah, junior on it. He, he does, he it yep. is junior. Um, okay. so you'll be able to see it. I, I post <laughs> lures that I do up there and fish catches, and you know typical instagram <laughs> uh devo before you run that oh uh, i was just gonna giveaway, too. Oop, um, uh, i want to ask oop, uh oop. frank another question and this is you know uh not a technical not a serious this is more of like a fun type of question um most people in here know that devo and i have our preferred methods of fishing but if you had to choose hmm. with perfect conditions for either or would you rather fish a frog or a jig? Ooh, good question. I'm going. I'm going jig. I'm going jig on that. If if I was catching the same amount and the same quality, because well, isn't Frank, that what isn't another, that how you preface that? Yeah, it's it's perfect conditions. Whether it be, you know, the perfect amount of scum for your topwater frog or your pads or however you love to fish now, it with the ideal catch rate. And now, wait, jigs. now, wait. I have a question for you. <clears throat> sure. Am I fishing the jig in those conditions or am I fishing no. the jig in perfect jig conditions? In perfect jig conditions. Okay. So I'm, go I'm going rocks. jig. Yeah, yeah, I'm going jig. Debo, I'm sorry, man. You got oh, of course another. Oh, yeah, everybody's like Randy. Everybody loves fishing jigs. Oh, <laughs> jigs are so great. Randy, see, Randy's favorite. Randy got me onto finesse jigs because, like, I was always comfortable swimming a jig or like flipping a jig. But Randy is Dizzle uh, is huge into finesse jigs. So, like, the War Eagle heavy finesse jig is his oh, bread and butter. Yeah, I don't know how day. many days he has slapped me in the face and literally like when he's really catching him on the jig he'll literally slap me in the face and let me know about it be like hey you should tie on a jig and i'm like i'm not you're catching him on a jig i will i refuse to do that so <laughs> awesome aussie cat i need to know right now are you in the chat uh, i'm i'm watching for him to show up and checking because back and you have to be present to win uh if you're canadian i'm not shipping you a 75 dollar package for because he'll Tours. do it wrong and have to redo it again, yep. and there goes $150. Yeah, yeah. True story. It did happen. I don't see him in here because if Mr. Awesome Aussie awesome Cat is not Aussie here. Cat, are you here? Make your presence known, please. Yes. Well, while we're looking. Yes, nine, nine bells. He is? Nine on the dot. Yep. Yet. Uh, is he in? Is he oh, There it is. He is. Okay, so they Mr. Are. Awesome Aussie Cat, I need you to send me an email to debosfishing at gmail.com with a screenshot of your YouTube so I know it's you um, with your address, and I will get you out a good package of, of some lures. Let me write you down real quick. On that nice whiteboard you got there. <clears throat> I, I only bring up that nice whiteboard, uh, Frank, just because I bought it for him. Because he talked about getting one for forever, and he never did. So I just went out and got him one. You're a good man. You're, <laughs> you're a good friend, man. What's that? <laughs> what was this? I wasn't listening. What kind of oh. BS is Randy filling your head with? Don't don't be I saying was, Randy's a good guy. He's pulling the wool over your eyes now. I was just saying <laughs> it, that's a uh, a Dizzle sponsored whiteboard over there. Oh yeah, it is. Yeah, I will <clears> give <throat> you that one, Dizzle. That has helped me keep my giveaways a thousand <laughs> times. Uh, cleaner i understand who i have to give it away to 
Uh, I just have to wait for the people's emails to come in. But yes, that is one of the good Perfect. things you do. Um, however, uh, every other trip we go out, he does try to push yeah. me in the water. So, Devo, do you want to do you want to go with the uh, the one of the classic fallback original or first time I guess guess on here question of the PB favorite lure t- favorite method type of fish? Yeah, that's this that's what we're gonna start. Fun easy. We're okay. going to start bombarding Frank with, we, we call it rapid fire questions. So we stole this from uh, aggressively average anglers, Burley and Paul. Uh, we like to say rapid fire toward the end to kind of end it out. So we're just going to pepper you. Okay. Best bait, best bait for a sea rig. Yep. Okay. Yum spine craw and a lizard. Yum spine craw. Is that the mm. new one that came out that has like the little. Um, yeah, it's got the. Like the two kind of big flappy looking uh, claws and like the little spines that go down the side of it. Yes, that's Let's it. Just bring it up. I, here. I, I so I do the spine craw, the lizard, and the yum money craw. Those are my three go to Carolina rig baits right there. The lizard. I feel like lizards don't get enough love either. They don't. Okay, so the yum spine. I just want to make sure this is the one. I did get a couple packs of those some time ago. I don't know that I ever. There yeah, these. Is. Yeah, these are newer. Yeah, I do like these. That bait is so money, it isn't funny, dude. What's your What's your go to color? Do you have a couple? Green pumpkin blue and Bama Magic, and then for flipping and pitching, I'll flip and pitch both of those colors in June Bug. Yes, purple, yeah. dude. That that's, that's money, man. Oh, there's it, it is a money. It is a money bait. And, and, I like that Bama Magic. Yeah, Bama Magic is absolutely a sweetheart. Green Pumpkin Blue too. Don't don't ignore that. I kind of like this Green Pumpkin Shadow. I like these two tone where it's like a darker and then a lighter of the same color, kind of. Yeah, the GP Shadow is a good color too. Um, I, I've caught them. I've caught them really good on that in the uh, Christy Critter. <laughs> Digs Outdoor says that's a half craw, half Helgramite. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, kind of. It's a hell. Little... It's a hell craw. <laughs> hell craw and i use it as a jig trailer too by the way okay yeah nice. i can see that for sure what's uh, your... real quick debo hey uh, yes. before you ask hey. the next question yeah. i just needed i just needed to throw out there uh, I think I missed gander a mountain too. thermal printer gander mountain thermal printers um <laughs> here in a second i'll De- stand up and get, some, get something up. to look at yep tom gross uh what was Did it 850 Tom's? 853 Oh man, chat was flying there for a minute. I couldn't keep up on anything. It was going so, so quick. And Frank, just an FYI, the uh, Gander Mountain and thermal printers, kind of oh. like a, one of those long running, you know, joke gag things that we have going on here. Debo usually brings them up at least seventy eight times per live. So then people take a drink. They've they've turned it into a drinking game where I, if I do any of those, they take a drink and. I'm assuming people are probably plastered by the end of my stream. That's why they keep watching because they don't even know what the hell's going on. So you mean I'm behind in a game? I didn't know I was supposed to partake in. <laughs> no, that's okay. I, I I don't do that on the on on stream. Otherwise, yeah, we'd be clear off and who knows where. Um, <laughs> Tom Tom Gross, uh, good good subscribe fish and friend. Uh, he knows about Stubby's pillow and a whole different joke, but. Um, definitely need to have Frank on again. So much good info. I agree. Scrolling through comments. I've had, I don't know how many things that have said, thank you, Frank. Frank is awesome. Great information, Frank. So people really appreciate it, Frank. And you know, stuff like this. Um, this is what we love to do. Like I said, beforehand is there's no strict schedule. We just like to have fun and all learn together. So from everybody else and me, thank you. Thank you for all the information, but you're not off that easy. We've still got you for a couple minutes. <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna keep we're gonna we're gonna suck all the information out of you. We can. I, I, I had stuff. I had stuff. I had I had I had tricks. I was gonna show you guys for painting and making your own masks. So I, we got to have another. We got to do this again. I had perfect tricks there's with a, stuff from the dryer. I had all kinds of dryer sheet. Interesting. Yeah. Super, super important question to ask, Debo. We're going to save the dryer sheet, even though I have a prime example, but we'll save the dryer sheet unless you want me to do it now. No, no, save it. I think we (laughs) might have to get more into like lure making. The the other one, maybe we'll focus more on some of that stuff. 
Perfect. I think it'll be fun. And then get into picking, picking your brain on some of this other things. Um, here's a quick one from Matthew. Uh, do you use Wonder Bread at all for bass? That's a good question. No, you know what? I never really have um, because I haven't painted it in my bass jerk baits. Um, I tried throwing a bandit uh, walleye deep as a jerk bait, and I tried the, the bandit uh, B shad. The B shad doesn't cast good in the wind. And the bandit walleye deep doesn't do what I want it to do as a jerk bait. Mm -hmm. Okay. And for those of you probably wondering, I'm not talking real Wonder Bread. Uh, it's uh, I th I think of it as ice fishing is really where I first yeah. heard of an ice fishing. That's the only color. time I've ever used it. Yeah, I know yeah. Like the walleye community guys will throw that, but it's like a white uh, base with yellow or chartreuse, blue and pink. Look at this. He's probably got one here. Well, I, I don't because these are all new colors I painted for Bandit and oh. Wonder Bread's not in it. Oh. But I have a, I have a, do I have the black version? SoCal Outdoors, good comment. He said, action is the attraction, color is the reaction. I like that for Crank. I like theory. that. I don't have it in my <clears throat> bag of tricks. Okay. Uh, just, just going oh, back to Oh, I got to, I got to do that question. So we ask Why me what up? you got to ask me. That's it. You uh, read just, it. Just, just real quick, I wanted to say, uh, going back earlier to Frank's statement of, um, I think, what was it, a shad color or something like that. What, what kind of bait is represented by, uh, you know, a Wonder Bread type of color? You know, those type well, of. Okay, so the w walleye, definitely walleye not gluten intolerant fish. Right, walleye sea color different. Um, the oh, really? hotter, the, the hotter, the crazier, the better the wool. I like it. And on the Great Lakes, it can mm. be hot, crazy, but it's got to have some purple in it. Um, and that's the deal with that. Um, mm. The well, Wonder sure, Bread, the, big, yeah. Wonder Bread works ice fishing even for panfish because it's white and it has color on it. And then most of the time, you're tipping it with a wax worm or a minnow head or mm -hmm. something, so you also have meat on it. Um, that's why it works ice fishing really well. Sure. Okay. Composite rod or glass rod for crankbaits. I am a big time, big time believer in glass in uh, uh, graphite crankbait rods. I do not use a glass rod at all. Really? Um, yeah. What happens with fiberglass? Now, if it's a, I have one composite rod. Um, Powell makes it. It's a it's a seven foot eleven. Um, is that the Inferno? It's a, no, it's an Endurance. Mm -hmm. It's the only rod I have that's a composite. All my other crankbait rods are glass or uh, graphite. Here's what fiberglass does: it deadens everything. So when I'm walking a crankbait, because I fish a lot of standing timber down south and stuff with crankbaits. If I'm walking the crankbait through the standing timber, I can't feel it. I can feel the line get heavy and the rod bow up as the bait's crawling over the wood, but I can't walk it over the wood as efficiently. Snatching crankbaits through the grass is almost impossible with a glass rod. Sure. Because the glass bends and the crankbait gets all boogered up in the grass. With a, with a graphite rod, you could snatch it through the grass and because the you have a more backbone in the graphite it comes through the grass better now i'll use a i'll use a soft tip rod the little faster action rod so the tip flexes and i legitimately have massive amounts of success cranking without losing fish massive amounts and and i don't use glass at all and i have one composite rod and all the rest are graphite and that's that's pretty much the same argument that i've heard is the the action you know that real slow real parabolic action that you get out of a glass rod that just can't be um duplicated in graphite you know there's those guys that use that that they're like this is why this is why i use a glass rod you cannot duplicate it in a in a graphite blank and then you've got the guys on the other side that say listen graphite's a lot more uh sensitive i can feel more with it and i can get you know a, a moderate moderate fast graphite blank you know the way that technology right. has come up now I don't need it to bend that much or have that specific. You don't. It's interesting to listen to those two. And again, two plus two doesn't equal four. 
No, but Draft Debo, guys can catch just as much. Glass guy, you know. Right, but Debo, I'll tell you something. When I'm cranking, there's a lot of times I could feel the fish swat at the bait or try to inhale the bait. Mm. And I know, and then I know he's tracking. So I'll pause that crankbait and then he'll crash it with it with a glass rod. I can't feel that. So I use the I use Good graphite point. because I I know everything my crankbait is doing down there. And I do not I God, this is the kiss of death. <laughs> I I uh oh I God I started it, man. I don't mm-hmm. lose I don't lose crankbait fish. Find some wooden knock on it right now. Yep. Here it is. Now tomorrow he's gonna go out and he's gonna send me an email virus because he's gonna lose like five crankbait fish. He's gonna be like, <laughs> damn you, Demo. Except that it won't cost me money now. <laughs> <laughs> hey, yes. Yeah, that's interesting because you hear that same argument on the exact opposite side of things for guys that use a glass or composite rod for chatterbaits is I don't want to feel every single little thing because, which I don't believe this, look, watching fish eat stuff, especially like, so I've got a, a pet a green sunfish here in a, he'll soon he'll be in a 55 gallon. No, he, dude, he's doing great. All healed up. You you guys won't nobody's, believe when I Nobody's him in a video. seen anything about him, but yeah. How no, I saw, I did, did you post him today on your Instagram? No, that was a little, that's my little desktop one. That guy is like, the guy I posted is about an inch big. Wait, is it he a is, cichlid? He is, yep. He's a little dwarf okay. cichlid and he is just right. an interesting uh, little booger. But no, Fudge Stripe is probably, I would say, nine inches now. He's getting to be quite right. beefy. Um, and dude, how fast he can hit stuff on top. Like when I throw crickets and stuff in. Oh, so dude. What I was getting at was you'll have the guys on the the graphite or uh, the glass composite side of things saying, I want that that deadening in the rod. I don't want to feel every single little thing because I can pull it away from them, right? I want them to get it in their mouth. I want that rod to start to load to give me that little split second of, and I don't know if you've heard this, but you know, that little split second of, oh, is that a fish or not? It starts to load before I can really feel it. And then I pull into them. That fish has got it solid. I never lose them. I don't know if you've heard that argument, but I've heard that too from I've heard it guys. I've heard it a million times and I don't care what they say. I'm never throwing. I threw a graphite rod. I mean, a glass rod. I can't even say the word glass. Okay. <laughs> um, I, I threw a fiberglass rod when when they first came out with them because it was all the rage. And literally my crankbait success diminished. I couldn't stand it because I couldn't feel what the bait was doing. All of a sudden I'd be reeling it in and there'd be a fish on this thing, and it was driving me crazy. So I said, I'll never do it again. I never have, um, and I never will. And that's that. I like it. Does it make it right or wrong? It's yep. just hey, my preference. Two plus two doesn't equal four in fishing. That's uh, that's the fun part is we can give we can give our uh, our arguments that we'll die on that hill for things, and it can be completely different for somebody else, and it works that's just right. as well doing it the exact opposite way. Um, All Mike I know said, is, is Fudge Stripe's going to be delicious in a couple of months. Uh, he, <laughs> he is a family pet. Once he passes, he will not be eaten. He will be buried <laughs> by the uh, by the hamster. Uh, by the by the by the fryer. So gotcha. far, that's all we have. Randy, wink, wink. <laughs> um, so Gramps asked the question. Somebody else asked it specifically, but I went past it. So I'm going to ask you two gear questions. Um, thanks, Gramps, for leaving that. One, since we know you like the uh, the sea rig, what is your go to Carolina rig setup? And you can go into brands and stuff if you have like a, a specific route. Like if you're a huge Dobbins guy and you like do the Dobbins 765, or I, hell, I don't even know what number it'd be. Um, so what's your combo? You can get specific with gear if you want. And then All right. I'm, I'm going to hit you with the second one. Okay. I'm using a um, 765 Powell Endurance, 50 pound braid. Uh, Sunline makes a fantastic braid, um, 50, 50 pound braid, and then a mono leader. And, and my leader is, I always start out with 17 pound mono leader. Now the trick is to adjust your drag appropriately because you want your drag to slip when you pull in on them to set the hook. You want a little slip in your drag because with braid, there's zero stretch. 
And so if you don't have that little forgiveness in there, you'll break your leaders. Uh, so that's which, which braid do you use? <clears throat> um, where's Sunline at? I can't see. I brought, that. Am I sharing? Oh yeah. yeah. Yeah, I see it, but I can't. I can't read that. I don't know because I use. I like their fluorocarbon, so I've actually had really good luck with the super. It's more on the the more budget side, but I've not. I don't think I've ever used any of their braids. There's the plasma. I think I've heard of. Yeah, people that's the it. Plasma. That's the pla It's the plasma. Um. 50 pound plasma and um and funny enough because i use their super fluorocarbon too and um yeah, i really like that one people kind of yeah, thought, it, you know, it, it's budget brand it's budget minded but it but it works works fine yeah everybody kind of talks about the the sniper and i forget what the other um well that's know, good that's a good there. line yeah Dude, that's good line yeah sunline makes really good line that's i'll have to try some of that i think yeah the, i was just I don't remember who it was the other day, just talking to somebody about the plasma. So, okay. What real, do you have a preference for real speeds and like type I'm, slash size of real? I'm, I'm, I'm my Carolina rod. I'm using a Revo winch five, four to one, 21 inches of line retrieve. You could use a, you could use a six, two to one, something that brings in 23 to 25 inches. No big deal. Um, I don't use a super high speed reel for Carolina rigging, um, even though I have friends of mine that rag me on it all the time. But um, I want the power of the low gear ratio so I could fight them low and slow. And I don't I don't over horse them in. Um, again, my success rate is so good with what I got. I'm not changing it. Yep, that makes sense. Randy and I get into the same arguments. He's uh, he actually throws his war eagle heavy finesse jigs for the longest time on his old uh winch for the exact same reason he likes the torque mm -hmm. he likes the power of it you know when he's dragging a jig and stuff uh you know oftentimes we're fishing it too fast randy will say Debo, you need to slow down you need to slow down whack he'll hit another one and i know for him you know the slower reel just kind of helps him mentally uh and physically slow down whereas like for me i'm like a seven speed most of the time on pretty much anything i do it's like so that's you know, it can always go both ways. I like that, that we can. Uh, yeah, it's, 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 it's hard to slow down a high speed reel when you have to slow it down because mm -hmm. you as an individual get amped up when you start catching fish. That's exactly. Yeah. And I and, tend to reel fast anyway, just as my regular cadence, you know, so that's gotcha. why I'll tell people if you're, you know, your regular cadence is fast, go down to a slower gear ratio. So I should, all signs point to, I should, but I, I get to be stubborn and I'm like, ah. Eh. I'll just stick with the seven. I can do whatever. Right. But you, you don't need a slow reel on everything, obviously. Sure. Yep. But yep. there's certain things where the slower reel really helps. Like like here, for example, if I'm if I'm target casting spinner baits, short range, heavy cover, real short range, we're not talking bombing grass edges um, or burning them for smallmouth. Um, I'll use I'll use my winch for that. If if I'm if I'm fishing them for small mouth i'm going to use an stx um something that's got some retrieve speed to it because i got to smoke that thing back to the boat sure. and i can't you can't take a low gear ratio and burn it fast enough and so then you got to go to the faster reel because you just can't fish it appropriately people are calling me out yeah no that totally makes sense people are calling me out on my whiteboard i do have Mr. Osamakon, I have not forgotten about you, brother. I appreciate you. You are here. <laughs> and the whiteboard is quite full. I did not make it at all over to the uh, the post office to use the thermal printer. Take a thermal drink. printer. Um, so I will get over there this week. I promise you all. Again, next week, <clears throat> if, if this isn't clear, minus, um, I think there's still, oh, no, the person. So funny enough, I redrew last week for the Sixth Sense winner, that whole thing. Um, and then the winner hit me up like two days after. It was like, oh, I saw your thing where you read your, and I'm like, oh, it did always happens. But I'll, I'll do another. <laughs> was, that, uh, was that the one I was supposed to have won? No. Uh -uh. I, th I thought it was the 13 fishing one. No, no, no. So I will I will get those out. If it's not clear by next week, minus maybe one if I don't have people stuff, I'm going to give away all my fishing gear back there behind me. Hold me to it. I'm giving away all of it. Um, uh -oh. okay. So we're at an hour 43. I'm going to be respectful of time. This is the question that we're going to end on. And again, so if anybody's just joining in, um, Mr. Frank Skillish, Frank has been an awesome guest. Uh, go follow Frank over at, so give us your, you can Instagram. look up Frank on Instagram. Yep. Scalish underscore fishing. And then if you want to watch some of the YouTube videos, go to, uh, 
LureNet YouTube or YouTube LureNet, and then you can look up the Bait School videos. There's we, tons of them. We didn't get much into the podcast too. You do a bunch of the podcasts, so follow. Yeah, I, I, I do day four uh, Bass Talk Live day four every Thursday. Bass Talk Live, give them a follow as well. Now, for this is probably the most important question we're going to ask you all night, Frank. What is your favorite breakfast food? Uh, and Chris is even saying, why is it B's and G's? Why is, is that your favorite? We'll allow you to, to pick your own. So what is B's and G's is my favorite biscuits and gravy being an Iowa guy. What's your favorite breakfast go to all time? It's really simple. Two eggs over easy hash browns and bacon. Solid. I'm not mad at that. Solid. Every day. Now, do, is it a is it a instance where you put the eggs on top of the hash browns? Oh, and I put the them on, onto it. I cut the I put the hash browns down. I cut the bacon up with a pair of scissors, and I take the yolks and I smash them right in there, and mm. mix it all together, and eat it like a freaking. And then you have to have one piece <laughs> of toast left over afterwards to sop up all mm. the good, all the good yolk. Clean the plate. Dude, I'm, I'm telling you, man. And if I if I don't do the yolk right, I'll throw it out and make another one. Oh <laughs> no, save it. No, no, no. I, save save I, those for salad. I, throw throw your um overdone <laughs> eggs instead of over easy. Dude, I I have broken yolks before and went in there and got another egg and cracked it open, took all the whites out and put the new yolk right on there. <laughs> man, I I'm actually, serious I, about his over easy. I just made breakfast the other day and I I remember I had six eggs. I cooked all of them because I think two, maybe even three, the yolks ended up breaking as I cracked them onto the skillet. I was so pissed. I was like, why are these yolks already broken inside the eggs? I don't know why they would make eggs like that. Dude, take the egg and take the knife and use the back side of the knife mm. and just hit the egg on the side and you can just go right open it's money we'll do so we'll do two more with frank we'll do a frank a lure painting and picking his brain some more than the third one we'll do a cooking episode with frank <laughs> <laughs> uh all right well listen folks we're gonna get out of here frank thank you again for the time dizzle thank you uh mike m said that dizzle's a stand-up american uh, I am just a trickster who's always loosening his drag and whatnot. Mike, I might have exactly. to put you on the ban list for that type of malarkey. You keep the <laughs> words out of your mouth. Uh, but listen, Frank, thank you. Everybody else, thank you for watching. I thank appreciate y'all. We'll be again here next Saturday. So thanks. And uh, until next time. <laughs>